Welcome everybody back here to Siegel Talks at the Martin Lee Siegel Theater Center, the Graduate Center CUNY in Midtown Manhattan. Um, it's a kind of a grayish colder day here um, in November and, um, and those wonderful sunny days after the election are gone and the uh, country is still in turmoil. And, uh, but we do think uh, there is, a, again, a light um, at the end of the tunnel. And um, I think uh, that uh, democratic forces here did, did prevail. I do think that the contribution of the arts um, are important, have been important, and uh, will be important. And to show that uh, theater especially and performance can be a place where we can reflect the complexities uh, of uh, this life uh, that we are living right now in the 21st century, that it helps us to know where we come from, where we are, where we are going to, and that it helps to create meaning and to make us comfortable with what's coming ahead in the future and also be part of uh, shaping it. Um, we have spoken to so many artists since March, theater artists, uh, to hear their uh, own experience of the COVID crisis. And now we also move on um, to, to discuss this theater and the political performance and the political, but also uh, dedicated series to um, Theater of the Real last, like we, last week. And this week will be to, to uh, um, the idea of the uh, dramaturgy and the new dramaturgy and the, also the uh, multifaceted uh, um, parts of that uh, field that is significant, that is growing and also very, very much connected to the Siegel Center and also here the PhD program at the Graduate Center at CUNY. And with us today, we um, have a dramaturg um, from a theater that really uh, was legendary, still is, but especially at the time uh, when, he, uh, when he was there. This is Sebastian Kaiser from Berlin. Sebastian, welcome. Thanks for Hello, taking welcome. the time. Um, he for, was, uh, part, yeah, thank you. He was part of the Volksbühne at the Rosa Luxemburg Platz in Berlin. It became an iconic theater at a time of change or a time after change. After the opening of the wall, um, it created a, a, a unique a theater and it was part uh, of, uh, of, of the engine of change and, uh, and defining, actually also almost an aesthetic um, of the city, but also um, was a place um, that uh, of thinking, of experimenting, collaborating, and of open uh, uh, access discussions and many, many things around. And uh, Sebastian, who actually also is born or was born in East Berlin, um, I was working there in over 30 productions, 3 0, um, with uh, Frank Kostov, who put his imprint, I think, on this time uh, post uh, opening of the wall. And also with uh, Vigard Winge and Ida Müller, both of them who also have been at the Siegel, great, great theater artists, and so many, many others. It's a theater that has been influential around the world. Uh, the style of the Volksbühne has been uh, 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 as significant in a way for the diverse. Maybe the Beatles or the Rolling Stones were for kind of a contemporary, also political theater. Also René Polish's work um, came out uh, at that time. So um, he curated also large political and artistic events, for example, the Africa Conference, 130 years of the Berlinization of a continent, and he cooperated in funding the movement D DM25, if I say it right. He was artistic director of an international festival, the Balaclava Odyssey, and now he also collaborates and works in China. He has deep ties to the Soviet Union, also through his, uh, through his marriage, or the former parts of the Soviet Union, Ukraine. And um, he has studied uh, music and theater at Leipzig, or no, he has taught at the uh, Freie Universität Berlin and the music and theater school in Leipzig and Nanjing University and in Oslo. So um, he is one of the workers um, in the, the great field of theater and in dramaturgy. And uh, I have many questions for him and to know what part really did theater play after that big time of change, something which we feel we are experiencing now in the U.S. and North America, um, and um, so I would like to know from him what was it really like, uh, what was the contribution of the theater to the city, and also his work as a dramaturg, how does he define it? So Sebastian, first, thank you, thank you uh, for, um, for joining us, for uh, being with us. Where are you and what time is it? Uh, I'm, I'm there, where I, I was born actually, so I'm in the part of Berlin, which was former East Berlin. So I'm living here, not far away from, from the location and the district where I was born. It's six uh, 
six o'clock, six p.m. in the night, and it's a, a lousy November day. Uh, city is in a so-called light lockdown, and the leaves are falling. So to have a walk now outside, what is still possible? So it's not possible to enter a theater. It's not possible to go to a restaurant, but it's possible at least to have a walk outside. But this is in this uh, in this November months. Uh, it's uh, yeah. Uh, so there can is the lock can be, it can be a bit depressive. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's these famous days when at 3 30, 4 o'clock it gets dark in the right, afternoon. Right, right. It's around, around 4 o'clock it gets dark already. Yeah. So, yeah. so there is a lockdown at the moment. Uh, it's, uh, they don't call it lockdown, they call it lockdown light. And lockdown light means especially so that the people who are working in the, in the companies and in the, in the, uh, yeah, in the companies say, uh, are forced to go to home office to work at home. But uh, the main target of this lockdown light is actually yeah, the, the public space, uh, the cultural institutions. So all theaters are, uh, are closed, all opera houses are closed, uh, the restaurants are closed. And, uh, but at least we can go out so the stores are open and uh, it's not so hard or so tough like it is, for instance, in Italy or in France, where we really cannot go to, this, uh, to the street. So this is no problem to, to move and to, uh, to, to walk outside. And of course, it's limited uh, uh, the groups and the people with whom you are allowed to, to meet on the street. This is limited. So this is lockdown light. But churches are open, for instance, uh, and uh, this is possible to, to uh, yeah, 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 yeah. To you, go ahead with, uh, with a religion. Yeah. yeah, you said there was an opening uh, of a cast off production. I think 50 people were allowed and had to be far away. But churches are, are open. It's still uh, it's kind of puzzling, you know, all the rules. Yeah. Right, yeah. Frank Kastoff had premiere with the opera in, in, in Munich. Uh, the opera house has a, a capacity of more than 2,000 people. And for the premiere, 50 people were allowed. Yeah. Uh, but the churches, at least at that moment, uh, were, were open. So they also see the priority. Also lockdowns and uh, lockdowns have priorities. And in that case, uh, it's not the God of the opera, uh, but it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, the God in, in heaven. So yes, the Incredible. Incredible. So Sebastian, tell us a little bit, I mean, not everybody knows, tell us a little bit about the Volksbühne Berlin, uh, about the theater where you were and, uh, and about your work. I mean, don't forget that I started to work uh, there, not of course in the 90s, because I'm, I'm too young uh, for, for this. I started to work there in 2008 or 2009. Yeah. So actually my entire theater uh, education I got from Volksbühne. Yeah, because the, uh, you must imagine the very special time in the 89, 90, when the two political ideological blocks, so communism and the rest of the, yeah, the self-identity, uh, free world, uh, when they came, to, came together, they were divided in the entire world, but in Berlin they were especially divided in one city, and then you had the, the wall in the city. And the wall was taken out of the historical uh, chessboard uh, overnight. And then, of course, you have a certain clash of these big blocks, the clash of two narratives, of two logics, of two languages. Even if we were speaking the same language in Berlin, German, of course, yeah, there were uh, different political languages uh, that were used, different attitudes to go to the uh, yeah, public uh, space to, to talk and to communicate. And this was an extremely uh, intense time when these two political blocks uh, uh, clashed. And uh, Volksbühne was in the situation that, let's say, in this vacuum, which uh, was created yeah, in, in the 90s, uh, in the early 90s, uh, by the clash of these blocks, that some very, very special spaces uh, emerged. You can call it heterotopic uh, uh, spaces. Uh, where things were possible to say, to try and to experiment, uh, which uh, were not possible in that way, not in the former East Bloc, uh, not even in the yeah, free West theaters uh, before. And uh, as far as I'm from the, from the East side, the destabilization in these times, uh, the political destabilization, but also in the biographies, because the majority of the, of the people, uh, of the parents, for instance, uh, from the from the classmates or from my uh, fellows in, in, in school, they lost their jobs in these months and in these uh, years, so early 90s. And there was a big uh, destabilization and uh, uh, the need to 
look and to find a new orientation. And the language to do it was everywhere limited. So it was limited in the family, it was limited in the school, it was limited later in the, uh, in the university. And uh, in that frame, the Volksbühne played that absolutely unique uh, role in the, in the 90s, and especially then uh, beginning with the uh, directorship of Frank Kastorf and his uh, dramaturgical team around Matthias Lilienthal and uh, Karl Hegemann. Yeah. So they created a very special theater, which was always more than a theater. So on the one hand, of course, they uh, offered performances with very different styles and aesthetic. So like Frank Kastorf did it, who was interpreting a classic, classical drama text, but integrating to uh, these uh, drama texts and performances, always some uh, contemporary questions. Uh, there was uh, Christoph Schlingsief with his uh, performances, which were always uh, yeah, crashing the and smashing the borders of the of the theater. Yeah. So we made actually yeah, in the on the as an ancestor of uh, Josef Beuys and as an ancestor, yeah, sitting on the shoulders maybe of uh, Josef Beuys, uh, he created performances which uh, you can perceive as uh, social sculptures. There was Christoph Martala with his philosophy of slowliness and so on. So there were these shows, but beside this, there were also always discussions, rock concerts on the on the, uh, well, the Luxembourg Square where uh, Volksbühne is located. So actually you could go every day to the theater and every day you got a new spirit there. In performances and in the, in the theater show on the one hand, but also in philosophical discussions, uh, in a concert, uh, in just maybe in some personal meetings uh, in the, in the canteen of the, of the Volksbühne, which was in this heterotopic, uh, heterotopic uh, space of the theater, maybe yeah, uh, one more exclusive heterotopic space, the canteen. In, in, yeah, this was, you know, really electrifying, I think. Uh, German theater, Western theater, knew it was a, a new, um, new pulse giving uh, inspirations. The Volksbühne means the theater of the people, almost like something like public theater as we, we could call it here. It also has a long history, right? Maybe tell right. us a little. Right. So the special thing with the Volksbühne is that it was not like normally the, the theaters in the in the West and in Western Europe. They were not erected and established by the order of a king or by the decision uh, of a government or uh, uh, of the city council or something like that. But it, uh, it was a result uh, the building of the house was a result of the so-called uh, workers' movement and theater movement. So in the 19th century, you must imagine the situation in, in, in Germany uh, uh, was, uh, um, was a situation where you still had censorship. And all these uh, authors, which are uh, now so classical to us, for instance, Gerhard Hauptmann, yeah, or also parts of the, the place of uh, Henrik Ibsen, they were simply forbidden. Yeah. And there's a trick in the, uh, in the, in the, in the German uh, law system that you can organize something, what you can, what you can call a closed society. Yeah, geschlossene Gesellschaft, a closed society. And for instance, not institutions, but uh, registered societies, registered unions, eingetragene Vereine, they can organize those events in a closed society. And so you could become a member of the theater movement and of this uh, labor, labor movement. And by doing so, you had the right to go to those and to join those uh, uh, shows and performances which were offered by the theater society. Uh, you could uh, yeah, just join them and by that uh, you could avoid the, the censorship. And that movement existed for, for, for a pretty long time, so for some decades. And it had an enormous amount of, of members. So when we see today this, this amount of, of people, it was something like, I think, 100,000 only in, 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 in Berlin. Um, after, after some decades, there was a wish also to build uh, an own uh, theater. And there is a story about that, that then with each show, the uh, theater movement uh, was presenting and showing uh, the visitors and the audience had to donate and caution. Uh, so 10 cents uh, uh, workers crossing to erect this uh, theater, which opened then in uh, 1915, I think, yeah, 1914, 1915, it opened. So it existed for more than uh, yeah, 100 years. So very special conditions as a, 
as a as an explicit working theater this uh, house was uh, was funded yeah incredible history that <clears throat> workers you know through that system of uh, subscription you know, created their own theater and it was possible to have it like, almost like the theater in switzerland during the world war ii when brecht went to work um, also thanks to a dramaturg you know which was owned privately and it was most probably the only free theater in the sp german speaking countries to be able to play the place they wanted from france also and from america in the time of third reich so the volksbühne had a great history i think also in front of it you know the nazis had their had their um, parades and their troops so it's an incredible significant place in berlin and for germany and um, after the opening of the wall that theater became um, like a crystal a diamond where more light was coming out perhaps and even was put in so um you were a dramaturg there and you joined that theater what was the job of the dramaturg what did you think was is the job of a dramaturg or was the job at that time of change that's it uh, of change so i was much later i was not in this I know, time of, still, of really yeah, change. Change. yeah okay yeah, yeah, yeah. you were still part of that yeah, so yeah. What, was, what was that job what did the dramaturg do at the under yeah. castors and um but this is also always this what my my mother was asking me and i never found a real proper answer to this uh, in general general to answer generally the question what uh, what the grass cast, uh, what the drama talk is doing uh, i would uh, maybe answer that it is someone who wants to direct it by himself but is not talented enough or brave enough to be a, 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 to be a director so it's becoming drama talk yeah. no but uh, uh, serious speaking uh, the so the function in the contemporary theater of a uh, drama talk you can describe actually on two fields on the one hand yeah, he is developing together or without the director he's developing the concept of a show he's uh, searching for a certain certain interpretation for instance when you're doing a classical text then you yeah just can stage it like it is written or you try to find an interpretation which is uh, uh, touching you in a, in a certain way so you read the text uh, and you try to find out from this reading an interpretation and the perspective uh, which might be interesting to you to the director to the actors and later also to an to an audience you're doing in the best case you you help to create the, uh, the text version of this but this is the the classical job of the German theater as it exists maybe now for I, I don't know maybe for for hundred years. Yeah. But in the last time it became uh, more and more urgent because also the theaters uh, changed. The dramaturgs started to work like curators, or that they uh, participated in the uh, creation of the artistic program of the house, besides the immediate theater shows. Yeah. And this had, has a tradition in Volksbühne, which goes uh, even to the late, uh, even to the to the seventies, yeah, under the directorship of uh, uh, of uh, Benoit Besson, uh, the first so-called spectacles were organized. Spectacles in that time that uh, meant that you do not show in one evening just one show, but that's a house for some hours, for seven, eight hours, maybe for, even for an entire day or the entire night, uh, is completely full with different offers of, uh, of, of theater shows and the theater shows also happening parallel and this audience is moving through the house and can create beside watching one show can create also your own uh, story uh, of each uh, evening you're doing and uh, what I was doing then, I mean, 40 years later, uh, after this, when uh, those spectacles were organized uh, by, by uh, Besson and his team, was to, to create and to curate uh, political artistic events, so events which were always on the edge, so the political and artistically, uh, to look for, uh, for a certain topic and to use the entire house of the Fox Premier to create such a spectacle for, for two, three days. This is also a work of the dramaturg, but this is a work which is then more similar to a work of a creator, for instance. But tell us which, which an example, those two or three days of engagement, give us an idea of a theme, yeah. who came, how did you organize it? Yeah, for, for instance, uh, this is uh, uh, what you quoted already in, 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 the, in your introduction, was an event, what we called, uh, this was organized in 2015, uh, what we called uh, Africa Conference, the Berlinization of a continent. And that was dedicated to the African Conference, which took uh, uh, 
place in 1885 uh, in Berlin in the old uh, Reichskanzlei and where um, the leaders of the European countries uh, uh, came together and actually made the distinction of the of Africa and uh, fixed uh, the borders of an entire continent, which is still uh, valid. And yeah, this kind of, I mean, when we hear now Berlin, yeah, so we always think, oh, this is this uh, party capital and so on. And uh, when uh, Germans talk about the histories and we always uh, confess, of course, good, there was this very bad and even Nazi time, but that's it. We don't want to go uh, deeper to history because uh, the burden of the Feskesem is already enough on the shoulders of the, uh, of the Germans. But the entire colonization and the role uh, which Germany played in it is still, I would say, uh, won't, which is not uh, enough uh, opened and open on the on the table to bring it really to a to a conscience uh, of, the, of, the, of the people in, in Germany, and so this was our our aim, our target, to objective of this event. Uh, to take the scene of the African conference to invite artists from uh, African uh, countries and to discuss the topic of this historical event on the one hand, but also of the continuity then, yeah, because there are certain certain thinking was set up in the 19th century and in the colonization, uh, which later then uh, in the Nazi time, for instance, uh, came up again. Uh, and yeah, so first we had the scene, we had an idea, we had the complex to discuss, and then we went ahead to invite artists from a lot of African uh, African countries, from Ghana, from Madagascar, from from Kenya, uh, and so on, uh, but also theoreticians, uh, also from from, uh, from from Africa, but also from yeah, Germany, from France, and to discuss. The Berlin Conference and its uh, yeah its its, uh, its its consequences in the in the 10th, 20th century. Mm. So in your with your work, let's say you worked with you know Castro on um, on a play, let's say a Dostoevsky adaptation or whatever, and then you organize this. was that half and half of your work? You were half involved in productions, half you organized. Um, 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 events, you created a space for um, representing the complexity of the lives we live in and showing the structures over centuries that have created it. So how, what is the percentage of time you, you spend on what we would call a traditional production and what, we, what you said, the curator's work, which is you know, an interesting combination, the dramaturg curator or the curator dramaturg, the dramaturgy of curation, mm. the curation of dramaturgy. So what, what are the how was that distributed? That's, that's actually difficult to answer because actually the full time full time job is already just to be in the productions. So to do the rest, at least for me, it was a bit like like the hobby uh, uh, in the in the in the afternoon or in the night or, or, or beside uh, besides the, the production work. So the production we did a lot of of, of, of production. Or I was involved in a, in a lot of productions. Also, I also must say with a, a very different intensity. Yeah? So. Um, Frank Kastorf is also a brilliant uh, dramaturg uh, by himself. Maybe he's even the best dramaturg, in, uh, at least in in, uh, in Germany. Uh, but uh, at least uh, it was always also okay for him and also for the for the team uh, of the house uh, to make something beside the original uh, original theater uh, theater work. Yeah. And then these yeah, conferences was where one thing, but we organized them also uh, uh, political events, and also you know, for Frank Castro, those things were just important that they appear in the house uh, that you have besides the artistic programs that you also have always uh, that kind of uh, political program in the house. So, did people come? Let's say to your Africa event. Did people? How many people? Come, how many speakers did you? Have, how many people came? Oh, I, I, I forgot. I mean, this the, the house was. Full, I forgot how many days it was it two days or three days I think it was three days yeah and uh, it was full I think three four thousand people something something like that I don't have three concrete feet. Uh, yeah, yeah 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 and uh, yeah because you have the capacity of the of the of the main hall which has around uh, capacity for thousand people but the theater was open during the entire day then yeah so we started with the, with the performances also in the small venues of the house 
uh, at at noon, for instance. Yeah, and then of course you do have uh, yeah in a, at, a, at a certain time you then only have one thousand five hundred or two thousand people in the house. But uh, during these two three days, and you have four four thousand people maybe, uh, which are uh, which uh, yeah uh, attending such an uh, such an event, and. Yeah, Volkspiel is not only the main hall and the main stage, which is huge, but it has a server, uh, plenty of uh, smaller venues. It has a big foyer, which can uh, can be used for for artistic uh, uh, artistic shows. Uh, it has a cantina. We also opened the uh, the part of the house, which is actually just for uh, for administrational purposes. So where you have offices and so on, and. By opening the house in this way, you of course you create also for the audience always a very special event, just that you can move as you want in these caves and in these tunnels and in the basement uh, of the house and to discover new locations. And by discovering new locations, you're also always discovering new topics and new uh, uh, new new artists and new artistic performances. Mm -hmm. So the audience, in a way. Um used the house, performed the role of the audience member in the house. And did, you, did they have to pay? Was it open, free? Uh, what was the... Uh... No, it's like always, unfortunately, we are, it's very difficult. We always wanted to make those events free and also the political events. This is a bit tricky with, uh, with the German law. Uh, so there was an uh, entry fee, but this was very, very moderate. So I, I don't remember how exactly this was. I see 10 euros maybe or 15 euros. So this was uh, uh, a very moderate uh, fee. And one must say also not only that the Volksbühne as a city run theater uh, has of course uh, sub subsidized, subsidies, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the subsidies uh, of, the, of the city. Uh, for those event, uh, events, we also ask for uh, special money in that case to the um, federal culture foundation uh, who also founded this project with a certain amount of, of money. Hmm. Um, Sebastian, for you, just and I'm just to ask to speak for you, what do you think? What is what is the work of a double talk? What should it be about in your definition? I mean, maybe this is now an epilogue also. Maybe I will never work again as a, as a drama as a drama talk. I, and we'll deal just with other things. I never learned it in, in that way. I never got an education as drama talks. So uh, therefore I don't have a formula uh, for this. Everybody must somehow find out uh, what it is or what he can do as a drama talk. I came to this uh, to this job or to this position uh, as a drama talk actually on a way which went far away. So I was uh, doing together with a, uh, with a friend a huge uh, artistic event in a, in a military, former military bunker in, uh, in Crimea, in a, in a, in a Taurus mountain. Yeah. Uh, this in was Crimea, a, Ukraine. in Crimea, in Ukraine. So till 14, 100% Ukraine. And then all these uh, events after, yeah, with uh, 2014 uh, shakes the situation. And, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, very, very heavy. But of course, projects, these in, those international projects only were possible uh, before 2014. After that, uh, it's simply not uh, possible. First project was in 2006 and the other was in uh, 2010. And uh, that was for me actually the most intense experience to work as a curator or as a drama talk, but you cannot learn it because I visited that place as a, together with a friend shortly after the last military unit, shortly after the last submarine uh, went out of this uh, marvelous uh, bay, Balaklava, close to Sevastopol uh, in Crimea. And I just had to walk together with the director from Moscow uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this former military town. Uh, we hired a fisherman or fisherman brought us on a, on a little boat in this now abandoned uh, bunker for submarines, which is located exactly in the Taurus mountain. So Taurus mountain where you have the entire Greek mythology, the mythology uh, of Iphigenia on Taurus and so on. And that place was closed as a military town uh, till, the, uh, till the late 90s. And this was for me such a gift to be in the right moment at the right place and uh, to have together with uh, the director from, uh, from, from, from Moscow, the idea, yeah, let's do a cultural event there. 
Yeah, let's create something in this Taurus mountain. Let's integrate the people who worked in this uh, in this bunker. Let's integrate the people from the inhabitants from this little former military bay in an artistic project and to try to yeah, create something culturally in a location, on a location which was before this only uh, used uh, uh, for military purposes. And by doing so, so this was actually, this was making art in real time of, of the change of an entire city. Yeah. And this artistic project then really had an, an yeah, immediate impact actually, at least in a short period uh, uh, to the change of this uh, very, very special cultural place uh, in the south of, of Crimea. And by doing so, I learning by doing, and in doing so, I yeah, just got the ability to write a concept, to write an application to uh, uh, to foundations. Nobody, no foundation, uh, no uh, uh, government, uh, not from the Ukrainian, not from the Russian side, gave any any money uh, to this project. So this was really just the strength of this location and of this uh, uh, place uh, to go ahead with this project and to formulate or something. And by doing so, then somehow, yeah, you've got a certain ability to create and to produce uh, artistic events. And this was maybe then the, the button to continue it then also in, in, in Foxborough. Yeah. But I must say, before I did this, I already worked as, uh, I made an intern already in 98 and worked as an assistant in Foxborough already as, uh, in, the, in, the, in the 90s. Mm -hmm. So these Ukrainian things and uh, uh, Crimean things, this was even after my first experience in Foxborough. Hmm. So you created performances, talks, uh, right. uh, get, had all those gatherings in the in the Crimea, and then people heard in about the bunker inside inside the inside in the bunker in the theater, a dark room in a in a, a black box. Uh, of no, a bunker. giant with giant water channel of four hundred meters, a bunker which had to be an atomic, uh, which could be an atomic attack, with facilities where uh, uh, torpedoes were were built, uh, with and everything underground, underground but with water. So actually, this is a big cathedral which talks a lot about the. Uh, it's impossible to take it away. You cannot, I mean, it's a bit like uh, with, uh, uh, with tribunes from the uh, Nazis in, in Nuremberg or even in, in Germany, mm -hmm. when after the war, there was, a, there was an intention to take it away and to destroy it, uh, to get rid of, of these uh, uh, monuments of the Nazi time. But these things were simply too heavy. It's impossible to destroy it so that you have still these tribunes and uh, and so on from the Nazis. And it's a bit the same uh, with this uh, military facilities from the Cold War, which were built in this uh, obsession you know, of a potential uh, atomic attack and which serve now actually yeah, that like, like monuments or cathedrals or ruins of a certain uh, period of, uh, of mankind. Of time. And then you, in a way, went to that cathedral of the, of the folk screen also that was built before in a completely other time perhaps, you know, for a subscription system that in that way also didn't exist anymore with workers. Um, and um, you, as a dramaturg, what was your aim? What did you feel, you and Kastorf and everybody, Marta, what was the, what did you want to bring to the city of Berlin? What was the idea of the Volksbühne? I mean, I, I cannot speak about the entire idea. There was not, not, we were not sitting there at a, at a table and then thinking hey, hey, which, which product we want to create. Actually, this was liberal in a sense that everybody participated just in this project of Volkswagen and put it, uh, put it in, in this project its own ideas. Uh, Frank Kastorf made his shows and at least for these shows, I can describe the target as something to make the things more complex. So when you quoted, when you said, for instance, when you staged a Dostoevsky show, uh, then of course you just do it in a regular way. You're reading the text, you're figuring out uh, which who can play which role and so on. But this was somehow not enough. And we tried always to go to a certain time, in that case, to the time of the 19th century and to stack even to put even more content in it 
to draw a more complex picture than even the, the novel is uh, drawing this. For instance, in the one show Gambler uh, we created in the, in the house, we found there uh, some political writings of uh, Dostoevsky, how he's dreaming about uh, colonizing Asia how he is thinking that uh, Constantinople uh, uh, must be uh, opened, uh, must be uh, reopened again as a third uh, Roman uh, Roman city to Byzance and to uh, to St. Petersburg, to the to the Tsar and so on. And then we took those political texts and tried, beside just staging Gamla, and tried to write uh, and to draw a broader picture of an uh, of an entire time of a period uh, which is maybe then yeah which we have to to decodate in a, in a different way and we have to decodate just a, a just a novel uh, but concerning the house I mean there were so many so many artists I was just a very very uh, little uh, piece uh, in this there were so many uh, brilliant artists beside Frank Castus, the uh, scenographer, of course, Bert Neumann, uh, who developed even when he made a set design. This was also half of the dramaturgical concept already, yeah, when he made the set design, for instance, for the Gemla or for uh, Brother Kar Karamazov. Uh, the actors uh, put it in their, their impact, had the ideas for the shows. So beside this, it's a house, of course, in a very classical and even not so sympathetic way was hierarchical organized. It always gave the free space to the artists to participate in it and to develop there in a pretty radical way, actually their, uh, their own wishes and, and, and projects. And Volksbühne was the addition of all these, uh, of, of all these pieces. Yeah. yeah, no, it was an extraordinary, or still is, and but at that time, an extraordinary place in a way also like a Schaubühne, a defined a, a way of theater. They also like two different, you know, families, two construction sites. They maybe didn't overlap uh, too much, but for the, especially for East Berlin, um, um, the, the, the work of the Volksbühne um, was, um, was, uh, was shining. It defined in a way also the image of Berlin. I think, you know, just to remind you, Bert Neumann, who you said, who created the logos for the Volksbühne, which reflected the Lebensgefühl, the feel of living, in Berlin, the aesthetics, an entire city saw itself reflected also in that change of a theater. It yeah, once used to be the workers theater, you know, then it was part of a, the Nazi uh, regime, then it was a communist, uh, the communist uh, East German um, government, and then now it opened up to the West, so all the open wounds and all the open uh, uh, strains of history, the circles, you know, where it came together there. And it is inspiring to hear that you say it was such an open place where people got together and that did their things. And it's true, very different. I like very much what you said about the dramaturg. I never learned it. Nobody, perhaps also one cannot learn it. Um, so um, that you learned it by, um, by doing. So um, which of the shows you felt you were connected most when you worked at the, at the Volksbühne, which is the one you... Oh, actually, this were the shows which dealt with a very, very precise history of the location even of Volksbühne. So one of my absolutely favorite shows was the Kaufmann from Berlin, the Merchant of Berlin by uh, Walter Mehring, um, an expressionist uh, writer from the, from the 20s. And he's wow. really the cabaret artist also, right? In the very beginning. Yeah, yeah. right. He was writing for, for cabaret, uh, cabaret yeah. as well. And uh, Piscard was staged uh, that show already, not in Volksbühne. It was already when he was kicked out as an artistic director in the late 20s. He made it in the, uh, the Piscato stage at Neun Northplatz, I think in uh, 29. And uh, that show and that play of, of Mehring uh, deals with a concrete location, and with a, with a place uh, where Volksbühne is located. Let's say in this triangle uh, of Alexanderplatz which you have, and Alexander Platz in that time, as Dublin writes about it, yeah, in his, in his uh, novel, Berlin, Alexander Platz, yeah, uh, full with uh, criminals, the depraved people. Uh, the, this was uh, Karl Marx uh, would describe the Lumpenproletariat, yeah, which collected around the Alexander, Alexander Platz, proletarians. On the other hand, the Jewish quarter, which was till the Nazis came to power just on the opposite of, uh, of Volksbühne, with Grenadierstraße, Hirtenstraße there. So the entire 
Jewish life of the immigrants and refugees who fled and escaped from the October Revolution uh, in uh, 1917 from the from the Eastern countries, like from Ukraine, from from uh, from Russian Empire, uh, but also from yeah, White Russia, from South Poland, from Galicia, they settled down. The poor refugees. They settled down in Rosa Luxemburg, uh, uh, in this area, which is now uh, um, around Rosa Luxemburg Square, Square Bülowplatz at, uh, at that time. Uh, and the immediate neighbor of the Volksbühne is uh, former headquarter of the Communist Party. Yeah, and Pescato was a, a member of the, of the Communist Party, and it was also his intention to make agitation in the sense of uh, Marx imagined it, to uh, create a conscience of the people and of the proletarians for a certain, uh, for, their, for their working and, and living condition, maybe to unite them uh, later and to uh, create revolutionary subjects out of them. And uh, Mehring is taking these different influences uh, from the uh, uh, concrete uh, yeah, location of the Luxembourg Platz is shaking this uh, together. He's writing, actually, like taking a camera and going around to all these uh, different uh, different places, to the Jewish community, to the uh, to the Alexanderplatz. Then always cut, 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 cut. Yeah, this fast expressionist uh, writing. This was actually one of my my, my uh, most favorite uh, shows. This uh, Sophie Royce played the uh, main main role, played the merchant of of Berlin in this. Yeah, but it's also because it was so precise and and uh, yeah, historical and dealing with this like concrete location of Volkswagen. Yeah, <clears throat> now truly they had uh, their their own still have or have been mostly had their own style. Lots of cast of productions were famous for the length of it for a stage design that could basically never leave the stage of the folks but it was too complicated to assemble and disassemble uh, uh, um, somewhere else it was really specific and just made for that theater for that time in that place i also remember when you uh, once came to the siegel and talked about your work you know that he had a unique work of videotaping rehearsals or something this is a radically different approach of creating a piece on on the stage, if you you know, which is also in a way a dramaturgical idea. Maybe tell us a bit about that. What you mean about the, the working style of Frank Kastorf? Or... Yeah, so that he, which is you know part of that aesthetic of the Volksbühne and what he mm -hmm. created, his work, mm -hmm. you know, that, um, mm -hmm. I think it's not so known. Uh, you mean that he used also camera in the in the shows, and that video yeah. was a was a big part in this. Right. Often yeah. there would be one rehearsal or two for I don't know if uh, yeah, yeah, this is right. but this this is this thing. I mean that uh, it's always a question how you keep a theater vital, yeah, and uh, how you you bring a certain idea and energy which you have in a rehearsal stage and in the in the rehearsal situation. How you bring it then really also in the shows uh, to the stage and the yeah, answer of Frank Kassoff, his special working style is uh, this that actually each scene it's drawn or it's drawn as a draft actually only once yeah so he's uh, improvising together with uh, uh, with uh, with the actors on the basis of his uh, preparation he's improvising each scene only once yeah? and then it's an enormous work for the assistants as well uh, then in the shows to fix everything to write it down all the rehearsals are recorded with uh, with cameras and then the assistants they made night shifts and they they try to fix everything like in a script uh, for like in a, in a film script actually yeah and then this film script is handed to the uh, to the actors and uh, the actors learn it then till actually the primary yeah, because there's never actually the time for, uh, for, for, for a run through. This is a very brutal method because uh, this brings, uh, especially the actors, of course, to the edge of this, what is just physically possible to, to do on stage, and to memorize these enormous masses of texts. I mean, you must understand, you have the novel of Karamazov, for instance, it's 1,400 uh, pages. And there's no fixed text version be, uh, before uh, before the rehearsal start. Yeah, so the actors have in the only the time to memorize the text they only have during the rehearsal process by itself, which is uh, uh, normally not longer than four. I mean, between three and five weeks, maybe. Yeah, and in this time, the actors have not only to learn their their role and all these movements on stage, but also the the uh, the text. So physically. 
this is this is this is a, a high level sport actually for the uh, for the actors um, but the idea beyond this if you can say so that there is a certain method uh, beyond this is how to how to how to bring a vital atmosphere from the rehearsal stage and from the first impulse of an idea, how to transform and to translate this uh, then to, to each show. Yeah, it's almost like a, a subconscious, Zen-like uh, yeah. uh, capturing of the moment within the moment. I just want to say again how radical uh, that idea was of Castle of the Volksbühne. He would say, this is the scene, this is the text, we're going to rehearse it once. You do whatever you feel close to, it's going to be taped. And tomorrow we do another scene. And then we redo, maybe with some massaging or some cuts, but we're going to redo what we are doing here. So it was also an actor's theater. And um, I mean, supposedly Karl Lagerfeld was known to uh, read books and he would pair out that page once he read it and burn it or throw it away. So I'm never going to read it again, so I have to focus on it. So this idea of a director rehearsing once and then like, collaging it, uh, things, if more or less, it's if, if I understand right, yeah. I'm sure it's not so black and white, but it is in quite a radical idea. I think it's not only that uh, Frank Kastorf was just sitting with a pencil on the table and thought, oh no, I'm uh, uh, developing now a concept where I rehearse only one. I think this was also developed uh, by during all these decades he's working as a director. And he is working since decades with the same actors also. And I mean, I came, I entered, uh, I entered that style and that uh, um, uh, that theater pretty late when Kastorf was working already 30 years in theater. I was less than yeah. 30 in that time when I was worked first time with him together. So there he had already a working experience uh, for 30 mm. years. I think that style came to this point just by doing it and working under this project for uh, under this uh, project for 30 years with the same actors who know how he works and who understand the ideas much faster than uh, when a new actor is just entering and let's say this system for instance so this is also a close relation an artistic relation between the director the actors and the sonographer and even in a wider sense some uh, people are dealing with the costumes with the, with the ones who are making the light because they understand certain impulses and how to transform them to stage it's an artistic collective, which is doing this. Huh? Yeah. In, in a way, a real, a real collective, and what the actor did in the rehearsal did matter, you know. So it was a kind of co-directing in, in in a sense, and then all these events, as you said before, around it. And um, so, were the Schlingensee productions um, um, things that were first? He creates something around it, or um, when he ran for chancellor or other thing. What was it, uh, or was it always? also a production of its own was the beginning uh, to have made the director to come or to create part of the of the atmosphere around this great I, and I, unfortunately i never worked again uh, worked together with uh, with with Schlingzi, so i was always uh, just in the audience hall as one of these thousand people or, yeah. or 500 people seeing this therefore i have no insights to uh, to the work of, of Schlingzi. but uh, of course he, he had definitely another method so to to work and to create this uh, shows with Schlingsi, you cannot uh, you should not forget that he comes from the film, of course. So before he worked first time in theater, before Matthias Lidenthal uh, was uh, calling him to work in in Volksbühne, he made a lot of those films which you can call uh, underground films actually, and he created, for instance, one of the for me still strongest comments on the reunion. Uh, uh, on, the, on the reunion process of the reunion of the two German stage, uh, states when he directed and uh, made in 89 and 90 when he uh, shot the film The Chainsaw Massacre yeah. and uh, where he said okay this is now the process of reunification and this has only one aim to make out sausages out of the peoples from the, from the east yeah. and this is in its radi radicality he made this film in the just during the process of the unification, in this process of unification, and uh, had this very, very radical uh, thesis. Uh, 10 years later, he said, even now I was wrong with my film. And you think, oh, maybe he said, no, oh, it was good because of democracy and so on. He said, no, it was even worse. Uh, uh, um, the, the, the Aussies were not uh, 
transformed to sausages. It was even worse. Uh, they were uh, uh, made, uh, they were, out of them was done porridge. Uh, it was only porridge, even not, uh, not, not sausage. I don't know if I make myself clear. My English is a bit yeah, yeah. limited. No, no, that's, yeah. that's, that, is, yeah. uh, that is incredible. I mean, I, what it shows is that this theater that really worked and functioned and had fans, it was full. People are coming. But that's when, you know, it, this closeness to that idea of curation, closeness to visual art or to film, interdisciplinary um, uh, work, political discussion. I think you also, you brought in big uh, philosophers, right? You brought in significant thinkers and writers to uh, talk actually, actually we tried to uh, to leave the, the level just of talks because i mean in volksbühne and my my colleagues uh karl hegemann uh or my colleague karl hegemann he started with this actually to bring talks to theater philosophical talks to theater yeah so slavi zizek was very early in the 90s with his uh, founding of the nsk uh, new slovenian art state New Slovenian Arts that was founded in Volksbühne. Slavoj Žižek was one of these uh, speakers. Um, Boris Groys very often was a speaker in, uh, in, in Volksbühne. But this were the 90s. And the 90s were this time where you just where was a longing and the need for analyzation of this what's, uh, what's going on. The time changed since, uh, since then. I mean, in the States, you had uh, the period of, uh, uh, of, of, of Trump, but also in Germany, there was a threat of, uh, of that right-wing movement uh, was, was growing. And the threat, even not only of a right-wing movement in one stage, but, but of an international uh, movement of fascists, let's say it in that way. So it's not only the time of describing the problem of this, what's going out on, but to use also the free space, free public space, which at least in Germany, the theaters uh, still are, and uh, this is a big bonus, and the big, big thing of the theaters in, uh, in Germany, and to use that free space and even to help to create political movements. Yeah, so it is very common in, in German theater to invite uh, dissidents yeah, from, from Russia, from Ukraine, from the North African uh, countries, and to celebrate and to, to admire them for their, uh, for their struggle against the governments. But I always ask myself, what, what gives us the right to invite these people and to make us equal with them? Because these people in their countries, they risk so much. Yeah. Uh, uh, before we meet with them, we also should actually risk something. Or we should introduce also these dissidents of the West. They exist. It's not only that, that in our system, everything is fine and nice, and the countries in the East, they just have to adapt to uh, our model. And therefore, I initiated a serial with talks about Europe, where we put the focus on the dissidents of the West and invited people like uh, Edward Snowden, who was sitting in that time already in, in Moscow. So actually with him, we had a video conference, home office conference, or, or uh, being locked in Moscow conference, uh, always uh, uh, Julian Assange, uh, who was sitting that time already in the Ecuadorian embassy and, and, and could not leave it. So we had first that serial of talks, among others also with uh, Slavoj Žižek, uh, and after a first meeting and first talk with a former finance minister uh, from Greece, um, uh, Janos Varoufakis, uh, there arose slowly the idea not only to talk, but to act also and to take action. And out from this idea, then there came the, the founding of a political pan-European progressive uh, movement, this movement you quoted also in your introduction, uh, DM25. Uh, which then even uh, was candidating and taking part in the European elections and which in that year uh, 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 established even a bigger project together with uh, uh, Sanders Foundation in the stage. They created now even a wilder movement than just a European movement together with the Sanders Foundation. They created now a progressive international. Yeah. And this is really an outcome and the possibility still of the German theatres that we really can, should not forget by all its critics about the hierarchical organization which the theatre has. All these critics are, are right and should be taken under, under consideration to, for improvement. But the German theatre, the theatres as free spaces on the one hand for create that really the artists are completely free in their uh, artistic creation and in the artistic style they want to use. And 
in using that free space also for political messages, this is something what is uh, unique, what does not exist in that way in the most countries of the world, uh, not in the States, I would say, uh, not in Russia, uh, not in, in, the, in some in, in the, in the Asian, Asian countries. And my, my idea was always to use the free space even to help to create, uh, to form uh, those political movements. Yeah, yeah, it, it is stunning. I mean, to remind our listeners, especially in the US, I think up to 80%, most probably, of the cost of the Volksbühne, which I guess is 120 million a year or? No, the, the Volksbühne has a, 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 has a budget, yeah. which is, comes from the, from the state of 17 million. 70 million, 17. 17, 17, oh, 17. 17. 17. 17. Okay. One seven. One the, seven. the opera, yeah, 17, one seven. One, one still, seven. What is still a lot, what is still a lot. I mean, a lot. It's not, not the richest. The highest part. subsidized theater in Berlin. No, no, no. no, no, no not, this not, is, not this is close. close. But in, 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 say that you got money from the city of Berlin and you still were one of the most fiercest critic of the city, of the capitalistic system. Yeah. Of, uh, but you still had the space to create and discuss it. And it worked. It connected people to the town and in a way it do also confirmed that it is actually a free society because you could say that you could do that and um, also early on hinting i mean you said where you live now you are born in berlin mid and east berlin 95 percent of all the people who live in your street left after the wall came down right I mean, the, the figures doesn't do not exist for the street but only for the for the areas and the districts and so, uh, during the last 30 years so the uh, i would say that 95 percent of the people were gentrificated out of the of, of the city so uh, there are only a very very few uh, uh, people left and when i want to speak uh, with berlin dialect and want to meet uh, uh, people speaking uh, with this uh, berlin dialect i have to go to the supermarket and have to go to the uh, to the cashiers so the cashiers and these low level level jobs, uh, there you have the people from uh, from Berlin, but they hardly live in these uh, uh, gentrificated uh, areas because they simply are too too expensive, and so yeah. they are just kicked out from their from their uh, native uh, neighborhoods. Yeah, 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 and the place also of really polish and so many. I early dealt with that in quite a fierce and, and open way. Um, Sebastian, uh, here a question perhaps also closer a bit to us in the US. You saw change in Germany. You grew up in East Berlin and you witnessed the opening of the wall. And as Thomas Oberender always reminds us, it's the opening, it's not the fall. People went on the street, people worked for it, people demonstrated also for it. So the wall, you worked in Soviet Union in the uh, Ukraine. Uh, through oh, Soviet Union. Through, in the former Soviet Union, the Crimea region of, 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 um, uh, of, of the Ukraine. Uh, you also now work in China uh, in the Beijing University uh, system. So these are three radical changes have taken place in these societies. Um, how for us here, and at least we feel this is a moment of change in the US, in the New York or wherever, there's something is different, will be different after the COVID, hopefully the election point in that way. So what, what do you think works? What, is, what can theater do? What is necessary? What can we learn from what you have seen, what you have been involved in? I don't have a, have a recipe for, for this. Uh, the first, I think what really we must understand now uh, that this was happening now with uh, with a pandemic and and with COVID, this is really uh, a system change, and it is one which comes not like the bang many people and even the the leftists maybe expected like in a form of revolution or of a crash of the banks and so on. I think this is a tsunami which comes in the in the in the speed of a snail, yeah. But uh, that tsunami will change everything and and, uh, and and a lot and the first thing I think what at least what we have to what we have to learn is to have an, a perception for this dramatic change of, uh, of, of society actually when uh, you George Lee invited me to the Siegel Center I was reading and rereading and rereading just one text of Baudrillard three years ago I had I read this text already oh, in my, Baudrillard, the French philosopher yeah. yes uh, I, I read these texts already in my in the, in the time of uh, uh, in the university, but I forgot how political it is. And 
in 89, so when just the Cold War uh, ended and when the you know, wall was taken out from, uh, from Berlin and from the chess board of uh, politics, he said, hey, let's not be too optimistic. It's not like that, that we uh, open now just the Iron Curtain and everything will be fine and great. And the democracy will come to the Eastern countries like the turtle is finding its way uh, uh, to the sea. Yeah? But when the East Bloc is toying, he's saying so, so John Broya is using this model, when the East Bloc is toying, then everything comes up what was perceived in this ice block. And what was perceived in this ice block are viruses. And this is Baudrillard saying in, 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 uh, in, in 89. And when the ice block now is towing, then this virus, that virus, it's coming and it's going to the West. And with, its, with the virus, it's, it's the virus is connected with a certain potential of destruction and of destabilization. And that virus will destabilize uh, also the, the Western, Western countries and the Western societies. But in the same process, when the virus comes from the East, there's of course the evil virus from the West, which is going from the West to the East. All this obsession with consumption, all this uh, obsession with, uh, with the media, uh, all this uh, yeah, uh, spectacle of the media, which is uh, not connected with, uh, uh, with analyzation. So what he, he used, even Baudrillard, in 89, the formula to say virus for virus. Yeah, we thought, okay, we have post communistic area. We have this was Francis Fukuyama is, is saying, we have now the, the uh, endless, enduring uh, liberal, liber, liberalism. Yeah, the end of history uh, just started in, in 89, and now the entire world will only go to the, to the shining side of, uh, uh, of, uh, of life. But said, no, this is the area of virus actually uh, what started. And when it was 89, the crisis and the crash of the West and of the communist system, I think what we are witnessing now is the same crisis even of the West. Yeah. And when you ask me for a recipe, I don't have this recipe. But uh, I think first we must understand that crisis of, uh, of the recipe. And the advantage of all these people from the, from the East is that they went already through this crisis. They know what it means to be disorientated, to lose, uh, uh, to lose the jobs, to be uh, uh, yeah, just in, in a certain historical situation, helpless and without uh, support and orientation uh, and so on. Uh, so this is an advantage of the, of the people from the East. What can I, what can I, what can I recommend? The thing is theaters have Theaters are important for two things. On the one hand, of course, for the artistic creation, for this unique space where people can meet in an intimate space and to have an uh, artistic outcome in a protected intimate space. This is one thing. The other is the public space and the role to interfere as a public space to a society. I think this is something uh, what also the theaters, as you described it yesterday, the theaters are abandoned now at the, at the Broadway. And I don't know how accessible these uh, theaters uh, are, but that could be an interesting thing actually to use these theaters also to substitute uh, uh, the public spaces, uh, which are just in all these lockdown processes, uh, which are gone and to have a talk yeah, about this, what comes next and how we can unite and create something together for mm, the yeah, yeah. next I think you said that also in the, uh... In Moscow, you know, after the collapse of Soviet Union, hundreds of theaters, you know, they were shut down, they were empty, they were closed, right? Not, not in Moscow. I mean, this is just, this was just an example uh, what is important for, for, uh, for the people in a crisis. Yeah. And now when I see and when I hear the statements from the directors of German theaters saying, oh, theater is so necessary and this is really like, like, like uh, breathing and like eating bread. I mean, it's good that they are saying so, but I'm a bit suspicious that they mean maybe only the, uh, also the privileges which are connected with the theater world and maybe their own, uh, own contracts. What happened in the, in the post Soviet time was that uh, a lot of theaters and cultural houses uh, were just used not as theaters, but for instance, as green markets. Or I saw still in Kiev in 2005, 
I still saw uh, in the center of the town, a former culture house, big culture house for maybe it was maybe 600 seats, uh, which was just a usual market where people could buy uh, cheap clothes and so on. And there you see how important uh, uh, theater is in this moment when people have really uh, other problems, when they have existential problems, and when they have a feeling which uh, is, uh, can be described with hunger. Mm -hmm. That's interesting, yeah, to, to say this was also a contribution of a theater house to be a place where you could buy the jacket you need, you know, yeah. and perhaps talk to someone and they're, they're coming together and the idea of a towns and flea markets. Um, becoming closer also to the end, uh, Sebastian, I know that uh, you are taking a bit time out uh, in that old uh, almost monkish tradition to take to think uh, what one does. Not and you did it even before I think um, the Corona crisis hit. Um, but still, in your heart, I do think you are a dramaturg. Um, and is there something you see, what you think about, or example, what one could say? Is there kind of a new dramaturgy evolving? Maybe also something after a Fox Green about in what you what you personally think about, or examples you see. Do you think there is a recalibration? And if so, what would be examples? I, mean, I cannot speak for for the new dramaturgy as a, as a system. I'm sure that now this crisis, uh, the crisis is somehow healthy, also like like Ato uh, wrote it. So theater is infectious, infectious, but uh, you can go out of this infection only on two ways: either with healing or with death. Yeah, and this is a radical uh, uh, position. And I think that it's an existential crisis. The so question why theater will also lead to a new, a lot of uh, new trials and new models of theater uh, networking, digitalization will play a role of it, uh, which one we have uh, uh, to see. I'm interested at the moment, actually, in this, what I try to describe uh, with uh, Jean Baudrillard. Uh, uh, who was talking about the era of a virus. And to think about the last 30 years as that kind of era of a virus, which led to this point in which we are uh, living in. And I was thinking now the last uh, months about a model, how to react on uh, this uh, crisis. And what is a what is you have outside you have a virus then of course you go to quarantine and you protect yourself the person who is doing this is a hermit yeah and the hermit is living in a in a cave or is isolated from the other people maybe in his living room or in a laboratory of a of a theater so i i'm thinking about this how to vitalize this model of a hermit and maybe of a network of uh, caves Caves can be everything. This can be a living room, this can be a rehearsal room, this can be uh, a, a real cave uh, somewhere in, in the mountains where, where an artist is living. I'm trying to think about an, an intelligent network uh, of caves and of an artistic production in, in such a model. I mean, it's not it's not 100% fixed what I, uh, in which direction it can go, but uh, I want to use it that model hermit, cave, networking, keeping also international. That is so important because we are all locked now in our, our, our rooms and in our countries because there's no possibility to, to travel. But remaining in contact to our artists and friends in other countries uh, is so important. And therefore, I appreciate also your, uh, your, your project with the Seagull Talks so much because this is such a good example to uh, discuss and to connect people from, from uh, everywhere in the world. I think this is actually also a new kind of uh, post-pandemic uh, dramaturgy, what you are doing with, uh, with the Siegel Talks. Yeah, well, thank you. That, that means a lot to me that you, you think it's meaningful. And how interesting that you, that in a way, the old platonic idea of mankind even, you know, the, the caves and the shadows, you know, that you say in a way, maybe we have to go back there and start and start and or take it serious also as a um, as a for a new beginning and not um, modify or adapt. You know, there's there, there's disruptions and there are modifications. Like someone said, the iPhone was a disruption on the phone market, and now the Google phone is a modification of the iPhone. But I, in a, maybe it is a time of serious disruption, and we don't modify what was before and massage it. But perhaps it is a time where we really radically have to. We think. I like very much what you said about dramaturgy, also the role of a dramaturg that you 
actually have to get involved. You have to do productions. You have to do your own project. Then people get together for a certain amount of time, almost like a rock band. Uh, you know, when you play together and then it lasts however long or short, it has to, that, which is not so important. It's more important that it's good, like a good novel. It's not important how long it is, but it has to be good. And, um, and um, that you say this is a, a way to do dramaturgical work, to be close to curating, to the visual arts, uh, to film, uh, and the other arts. So it's, it, that is really a significant, you know, impulse also for us to think about and your experience to, in, you know, in these uh, times of changes you already went through and perhaps there's something that is ahead of us. And we will continue to explore this this week um, at the uh, Siegel Center, the idea of dramaturgy. There will be also other weeks. We feel it's at the center also, you know, next to that idea also, which we did last week, the theater of the real, that we also will talk on site-specific or on-site theater, as Bertie Thornton reminds us to call it. Um, but um, the, the idea of a dramaturgy perhaps is what's missing and has been missing there bigger context uh, the, that really reflects the complexities of the world with additional uh, areas, arenas that theater gives to audiences to think, to discuss, to show the best ideas, to have a competition of good ideas in an agonistic way as we learned from Thomas Florian Malzaka when we, when we talked with him. So tomorrow we will continue. We have uh, the great N. Catanio from Lincoln Center Theater who over decades also runs the uh, director's lab. He's been very influential, a global project, very significant. And um, she will come uh, and speak with uh, Sidney uh, Mahone about the golden age in a way when dramaturgy entered the American stage in the 70s and 80s. And she actually was a motor, an important part of it. And it's good to remind her where we come from in all her work uh, she created with Lambda and now she's creating a Wikipedia page of documented um, um, and that work. And uh, on Friday we have Peter Eckersall, my colleague at the Goddess of CUNY who is teaching dramaturgy, also has ideas of a, a new dramaturgy. He's writing a book um, at the moment and he will we will join him in the process while he is also trying to figure things out in the lockdown more or less next to his work to to think about that what is not there, but what is so important and essential. So uh, really, Sebastian, this was a, a, a great talk, and I hope uh, we will have other ones that people who will listen to can contact you, that you will find uh, also uh, ways of engagement, you know, in, 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 in the times ahead of you that, that connect to that experience. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, uh, sure of that. I think it's also courageous, as you said, you know, we invite other people who speak up in with risk, are we taking really the risk? Are we as honest, you know, as those people we might uh, invite and present and in a way for you also to say, I go now in the research phase, I go in a cave, I, I rethink maybe this is the best to, to do at this moment, to think right and to, 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 to collect and connect to what's inside us. So it's, a, it's an important um, um, uh, uh, contribution also in what, how to deal with this time. So thanks to HowlRound for uh, being a, a platform for this uh, you know, global discussion that I think you're also right. We can no longer think in national borders, um, even so New York already is so vastly different than Texas uh, or, or California or Alabama in, in one nation already. It is so different. Um, the word meaning already has so many different meanings. And, uh, but if there is a fight for uh, you know, uh, ecological crisis against racism and others. It's a global one, actually, and it might help us to get, get through it, and we have to have to honor that. So thank you. Um, thanks thank for you the for the invitation. Thank you for yeah. giving us the possibility yeah. for the talk. Thank you. HowlRound for VJ, yeah. uh, the great Thea, who gets up in Los Angeles every morning before 9 a.m., which is terribly early for every actor and director, so we appreciate that, yeah. and uh, I hope you will all um, continue to listen to us. We will take a break in Thanksgiving week and then be back after that. So Sebastian, again, thank uh, you. And I'm sure we you. only scratch the surface, but I think we get an idea for the idea. And this was a really illuminating mm -hmm. and, a, and a very uh, meaningful conversation. Thank you. Thank you.